Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In our next conversation with Dr. Michael Quinn, we're going to talk about the LDS succession crisis. John Hamer has claimed that, that he feels that Sidney Rigdon had the greatest claim on succession according to LDS canon and church law. I'll ask Dr. Michael Quinn that question and see what he has to say. Check out our conversation. Now you mentioned the uh, the blessing, uh, patriarchal blessing for Joseph Smith III. Uh, one of my interests has been um, to talk a little bit about the secession crisis. So as I understand it, um, if Joseph Smith died, the next person in line would have been Hiram Smith. He was joint president and everyone understood this. And, uh, and Joseph did not want him to go to, to the jail with him because uh, Joseph Smith thought that this would be the end of him, being in, in Carthage jail. The end of Hiram or the end, the of, end of him? The end of him, himself. Okay, Joseph, okay. But other men went with him, uh, including Hiram, and Hiram wouldn't, wouldn't leave. And, and, and so Hiram wasn't him. actually arrested. He was just there to support Joseph. He was there, and, uh, and none of the other men who were there with him, it was the arrest warrant was for Joseph. Oh, really? It wasn't for any of those. Who had been, and and the the uh, when I say the the attenders of uh, or the other occupants of his cell in Carthage jail, none of them were under indictment and none of okay, them had so been arrested. So it was only Joseph. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I know John Hamer has said that um, with both Joseph and Hiram dying at the same time, the person most likely to succeed was was probably Sidney Rigdon. It wasn't Brigham Young. It could have been a variety, and, and the article that I published in 1975, before years before uh, Hoffman came out with uh, any of the, the uh, wonderful documents that he came out in Mormon history about, um, I said that there were seven legitimate ways of succeeding Joseph Smith that he had made provision for, either within his published revelations or within things that he had done that were well known. And Brigham Young was only one of them. Sidney Rigdon was, uh, was a surviving counselor, was only one of these methods. And, and Brigham Young and the Twelve Apostles was in many ways a distant possibility by revelation. But in terms of what Joseph Smith did in policy, at Nauvoo with regarding the Quorum of the Twelve, they became a more likely re, uh, succession option because of the power that he had given them within Nauvoo itself, the, which was the headquarters. Uh, typically, by the revelations, the authority of the Twelve ended when, when uh, there was an organized stake with a stake president. They had no authority within a stake, and so the stake president of the central stake, who at that time was uh, William Marks, had a claim on, on, and so I looked at all of these. So I, I would disagree with John, John Hamer that Sidney Rigdon was the most likely. He was the first publicly proposed alternative to the Quorum of the Twelve, and, and he was voted down. Uh, by the congregation that met in August of 1844. Uh, and when their choice was only Sidney Rigdon or the Quorum of the Twelve, they chose the Quorum of the Twelve to continue in the Twelve's position in its place of having all this prior uh, role uh, administratively within Nauvoo, the headquarters of the church. Uh, and they uh, rejected uh, Sidney Rigdon. But the fact that he was the first publicly proposed doesn't mean that either one of them was the most likely. It was that was the choice that the Foot Quorum of the Twelve and Sidney Rigdon had advertised. And, and this had been advertised before the Twelve was even back in Nauvoo. Most of the apostles, members of the Quorum of the Twelve, were in the eastern states. And there were only one or two members in Nauvoo, and two of, two of them were wounded in, in the uh, attack on Carthage Jail. Uh, Willard Richards, the least wounded, got a bullet through his earlobe, 
and John Taylor got four bullets in his body. He was riddled with gunshot. And uh, so he was near death at a certain point, severely wounded by the August meeting, able to limp up onto the stand as one of the 12. But, you know, there were, during that summer, the one who was being privately pr promoted the most, uh, particularly by Emma Smith, was William Marks. Oh, wow. Uh, the stake president, and she used the published Doctrine and Covenants as the reason for him being the next president of the church. So uh, that's why I say that in terms of those at s church headquarters, it was either the 12 or William Marks. Those who were in the know about how little Brigham Young or Joseph Smith uh, respected Sidney Rigdon by 1843 and 1844 um, knew, you know, his name wasn't even mentioned in those discussions that were going on uh, that we know about through the diaries of the apostles and through the diaries of, of uh, Joseph Smith's private secretary and also through the, um, the diary of Joseph uh, Tudor. The tutor that he had hired for his children uh, was living in uh, the mansion house when Joseph was murdered. And his, and his diary also shows how William Marks was the one that Emma was talking about and arguing for. So um, Sidney Reardon wasn't even on the screen of most of those who were at the core of leadership and of Joseph Smith's life, including his widow. Um, but Sidney Reardon came back to Nauvoo before the Quorum of the Twelve. He, he set up this meeting and this meeting was to choose between what he gave as the choice to the members of the church, me or the Quorum of the Twelve. And he thought sure that the, quorum, that the church would choose him over this group which was scattered around even you know, at the death of Joseph Smith. Well, didn't William Mark support Sidney Rigdon as well? He did. He did. Even though he could have, he could have made an in, and there was re a doctrinal revelatory reason that he could have been far more powerful an advocate of his own claim than the Quorum of the Twelve, who by the revelations had no authority in an organized stake. And he was president of the central stake at head church headquarters, but he never advocated himself. If he had, it could have been really rough going for the Quorum of the Twelve, because it was easy to, to dismiss uh, well, uh, Rigdon, Sidney Rigdon, who was a loose cannon and mentally unbalanced and had no, and people had known this for more than a decade. So why did Joseph pick Sidney as his vice presidential candidate? Because he had religious uh, uh, background. He was a, a minister well known in the group that later became the Disciples of Christ and, uh, and he was a group, uh, a leader who was a very forceful speaker where Joseph Smith wasn't. He knew the Bible as well as Joseph Smith. Joseph had virtually memorized it, but he was accustomed to speaking, public speaking for years before Joseph and he met one another. And that was not the case with Joseph. Joseph was shy. And according to, and he, and he spoke with a, a whistle after 1832 because he'd been smashed in the face by a mob that had tarred and feathered him. And so uh, after 1832, at the time that he established counselors and a first presidency, uh, he, he chose Sidney Rigdon as his spokesman because Sidney Rigdon had you know, a, a presence. He was a, an orator who could sway crowds and often spoke to crowds for hours at a time. And Joseph Smith, one of the early devout members of the church, uh, talked about a meeting where Joseph spoke and then Sidney Rigdon spoke and Hiram spoke. And, 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 jo and the devout member of the church was Jared Carter and his diary said, well, Joseph gave one of his pathetic sermons. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And then we heard a wonderful sermon by Sidney. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, so he was not a, known as a speaker in the 1830s. That changed. 
and by the 1840s, he impressed non-Mormons who heard him speak in Nauvoo. Mm. But that was a growth period for him. And in the 1830s, he was a very shy person. Okay, so you, you've said Sidney Rigdon, Brigham Young and the Quorum of the Twelve, William Marks. Um, who are some of the other? Uh, the uh, pat patriarch to the church who at Joseph Smith's death or soon after was uh, well, his brother, William, who was not ordained patriarch until after Joseph Smith's death, and he was ordained by the Quorum of the Twelve, and he was himself an, a, a member of the Twelve. But as soon as they gave him the position of presiding patriarch, he began saying, I'm like Hiram Smith, who is patriarch of the church, and I have, I have the right to be the president of the church. The, I mean, the Twelve never regretted anything as much as they regretted letting him become uh, the patriarch to the church. And he didn't last patriarch very long, no, right? No, not very long. Was it six months? Yeah, and that's because Joe Brigham Young was uh, consolidated his support in at headquarters and elsewhere, but primarily headquarters. Um, and so that was another option. And a third option was a son, uh, not just a patriarch, but a son. And his son was 11 and a half when he died and that was Joseph the third and he and it's very clear to me from the evidence that he expected his son one day to lead the church but not when he was 12 and so it was a thing way down the road decades because Joseph Smith's own statements uh, and one of his revelations indicated that he expected to live until he was in his 80s and uh, so you know by then uh, Joseph the third would have been in his 60s and that would have been a, a good time to surrender the reins of the kingdom of God to a son. So although Joseph had the plan for his son, undoubtedly to be an apostle, uh, maybe patriarch to the church uh, instead of one of Joseph Smith's brothers, Joseph Smith did not expect to die in, in at the age he died, 39 until it was too late. And it was too late to designate anyone else. I mean, he was dragged from Nauvoo uh, by officers of the law and uh, the people he spoke with, he was saying goodbye to, I'll never see you again. Because he knew he was, he was done for. Um, and his only hope was that the Nauvoo Legion would, would rescue him, and they didn't. And the mob that came, initially he thought it was the Nauvoo Legion to, to spring him out of jail. And that wasn't to be. Well, and I guess Mark Hoffman even invented a letter um, yeah. about that with, from Jonathan Dunham. Yeah. Dunham. Can you talk about that? Well, yeah. Jonathan Dunham allegedly, and according to members of the church, and these accounts were fairly well known uh, in Utah, that uh, members of the church in Utah said that Joseph had instructed Dunham <coughs> to bring the Nauvoo Legion to Carthage and rescue him. And Nauvoo, uh, the, the Nauvoo Legion, not too many people realize this, but as an organized military body, it was second only to the U.S. Army in 1844. Mm. And um, if Dunham had brought it to Carthage jail. The jailers couldn't turn away a, a mob of a little over a hundred, if that much. They cer certainly couldn't have turned away the 4,000 member Nauvoo Legion that Joseph Smith was the commander of. And the second in command in that time period was Dunham. And according to informants in Utah and some in Illinois, Joseph had given instructions that if I'm taken to jail, uh, you are to rescue me. And that Dunham declined because Dunham knew it would be a bloodbath if he did. Not at the Carthage jail, but af the aftermath. Because here Joseph Smith was accused of treason for destroying a printing press and a newspaper. What would have been the response of the governor and of all the other county sheriffs, including the one, uh, the county in which Nauvoo was located, if Dunham had brought a private army of Mormons 
to rescue Joseph Smith from county jail where he'd been set, sent by legitimate authority and uh, taken away from the uh, rule of law. Um, I don't think there would have been anything that could have stopped a united uh, con a attack on, on uh, Nauvoo by people in, in, uh, in retaliation for this, this unlawful springing of Joseph Smith from Carthage Jail. And so uh, Dunham refused to obey the command. Now, I doubt that the command was ri written. I mean, because there wasn't a document, uh, Hoffman forged one. But uh, I think the, r the stories that Dunham turned away from an obligation to, re, uh, to save Joseph uh, were circulated enough that that it was something that, that he understood at least as a verbal order from Joseph Smith. Okay, so you think that there really was a verbal order mm -hmm. to, to spring Joseph, really? Yeah. Uh, wh where do you, I mean... Well, there were a number of people who, in talking about the the uh, those who were at the jail that um, and I, I have I haven't looked at these documents for a long time but there was a history of the Nauvoo Legion for one that was a manuscript history that I cited in the um, I cited for another reason but within that Nauvoo uh, manuscript that was written sometime between 1845 uh, and uh, 1846 uh, that uh, Joseph had given the order to, to um, Dunham to rescue him, and uh, that this was why Dunham was rejected. This was later stated by people and published in various uh, accounts of Joseph Smith's death, written in, in uh, by some by non-Mormons, some by iffy Mormons. Uh, in in the 1850s and 1860s, as being a rumor that was being circulated, and the uh, the death of Dunham was often ascribed to guilt over having disobeyed that order, and that comes also out of this early history of the Nauvoo Legion that was written within Nauvoo. That because of guilt, he asked another member of the Nauvoo Legion who happened to be a member of the Council of Fifty, uh, the theocratic body, to kill him, to blood atone him, which was the term that was used. Uh, to for kill Dunham? Dunham, as a, as a recompense for having allowed Joseph Smith to be murdered in, in the Carthage uh, uh, jail rather than following his duty of, of rescuing him. And uh, Joseph, uh, uh, wouldn't have required that. I think Joseph was a forgiving person, but uh, those who blamed uh, Dunham for the act felt this sense of good riddance when he went off with an in a Native American who, whose identity we know um, and uh, w disappeared in the wilderness and, and everyone said, yeah, good riddance. Mm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Michael Quinn. In our next conversation, we'll talk about James Strang. He was one of the leaders that tried to take over the leadership of the Mormon Church. I'll ask Dr. Quinn what he thinks about James Strang's letter. Okay, so what do you think about Strang, Strang's claim? Absolute fraud. Really? Oh, yes. Oh, wow. I hope you enjoyed that short clip from our next interview. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please go to our patreon.com slash gospel tangents and subscribe for just $5 a month. If you'd like a transcript of this, please click the yellow subscribe button at gospeltangents.com and I'll send you this and all future transcripts. Also, if you'd like a paperback like we've got here, those are available at our website at amazon.com. Just do a search for gospel tangents. Please get all updates at our Facebook page at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. We're also on Twitter at gospeltangents. You can also get transcripts individually at our website, gospeltangents.com shop. Finally, make sure that you subscribe on our 
Apple Podcast page. Just do a quick search for uh, Gospel Tangents there and give us a five-star review while you're at it. Thanks again for listening. Your support helps create more Mormon history classes and podcasts such as this. And so I really appreciate you listening. Please share with your friends. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our great videos. Thanks again.